What's up everybody, do right back at it again with another video on Ready or Not because there was an AMA or Ask Me Anything that the developers did not too long ago in their Discord. So I decided to stream it and you can find a link to that in the description or at the top right if you want to find the full unedited version of this AMA. But the reason why I'm doing this video is because a lot of you asked me to condense down the stream, so that's what I did. On this AMA, there was the community manager that was asking a bunch of questions, vetted questions, to four developers. Hello. I'm Rapolio. I'm a 2D artist with Void. I do concept art, graphic design, and some UI stuff. So yeah, I've been with the team since 2019. All right, cool. Pixel? Yeah, I'm the, the UI UX designer for the game. I joined uh, February, March last year, and it's just been working pretty hard. A lot of the time recently they've put into the loadout stuff. And Navarro? Yeah, I'm Navarro. I do all the gun sounds for the game. Firing, reloads, all that type of stuff. I joined back in about February 2021, maybe before then. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, I do all the gun sound effects, reloads, everything. And Mr. 3D. Hello there. Uh, yeah, uh, I am uh, the lead uh, environment artist, uh, but I also uh, I'm kind of one of the core content creators of the environments as well. Um, and as, as part of my roles, I also look after a small team of other environment artists that help me out. Uh, I also manage some of the outsource studios who, uh, who do the props and support us with that. And I collectively just work throughout the team, um, a lot of optimization from the visual side of things. Um, yeah, got my my hands on a little bit of everything i suppose <laughs> and these guys did give quite a bit of information so i might chime in just a little bit but for the most part it's going to be the developers talking let's go ahead and just get into it will there be pre-mission briefings where you can actually see the map kind of draw on it plan out make routes actually yes it's already being worked on so planned for a while now just trying to find the best way to do it but ideally it's going to be a just overall good system that the community i think has been working I'm pretty excited about it. It'd be very nice to be able to fully plan out what you're doing and not just go in blind. Yeah, exactly. We're even doing things. We're going to look at uh, it's no promises because there's a lot of things going on, at least for the, the first pass of it. But uh, being able to select like, actual level entry points, uh, set different things. And if we can eventually do it, the ability to interact with uh, the doors that view on the map. But we kind of want it to have sort of a realistic take and not every situation is going to have some detailed, accurate blueprint. So you know, meth house or something like that could just be <laughs> not saying it is, but like a drawing of a napkin. It's about trying to maintain a little bit of that realism, allowing people to still plan things out. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just to, just to kind of jump on the uh, the other side of that as well. It's like we feel that sort of it's one of the things that it's, it, at the moment, it's kind of the most thing that's lacking when it comes to kind of the game. Like it's a very rudimentary system of just selecting your map and then you jump in. And it's 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 almost like one of those things where we have so much personality within the city itself. Like realistically speaking, the, the actual city itself is the most fleshed out character in our game. Like we want to inject as much kind of life. You know, we want to make this city feel lived in like it's a real place even though it is effectively a fictional city so we're going to take this opportunity when we start implementing this stuff to allow the players to kind of like really get an in-depth sort of like look at these individual places where um, you know i'm not saying for 100 percent we figured all of this out exactly what we want to do but even just to kind of like you know zoom in a little bit on the map so you can see where it is in location to everything else and having just a little bit more of a realized vision of what this kind of like map and the city can look like as you're selecting the missions as you're planning out your routes as you're kind of making these pre-game tactics into the levels we feel like that's an excellent opportunity to just like bring more of that city personality to the player and i think that's really important for our storyline as well it'll be interesting i think because uh swat 4's maps and blueprints were pretty interesting they would be on like a whiteboard or like a napkin or there would be a full-on actual blueprint so i kind of want to have that variety as well just because it adds some interesting character to like your planning and the map itself and it sort of prepares you for what you're going into yeah i mean i remember early on when we had uh some ideas for like the blueprints for a uh, hotel there was talks because it's been like an old building that's been renovated a lot that the blueprints wouldn't necessarily be accurate or up to date so you might have rooms that aren't on the blueprints or or uh routes that are listed on the blueprints but aren't there actually stuff like that so you couldn't necessarily just have some one-to-one -one plan in the map yeah like the current hotel is like under construction so a lot of the rooms there that were from the 80s aren't there anymore or they were being renovated completely so that inconsistency you need to watch out for more on hotel later because uh probably going to change 
in the future, getting overhaul. Yeah, that one's always getting overhauls. <laughs> I mean, it, it's always beautiful. It's just a matter of how it's running and how it's playing in terms of like uh, gameplay and layout and stuff like that. But I've seen some pretty cool iterations over the past year and a half. Yeah, for sure. I, and I think it's almost like a testament to us and what we're doing where, you know, some of, some of the earlier maps that we were still trying to figure stuff out on in our early stages of our sort of like development where we've implemented all this new stuff and we've grown as artists and developers and we've found what works and what doesn't work and it's 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 one of those things where you know i've worked on tons and tons of games at this point there's usually a point where you know as you go through development cycle in the game the earlier stuff either just doesn't hold up in terms of quality or maybe you know the, the gameplay mechanics have changed or yeah so i think hotel and maybe even port at this point as well is it's kind of suffering a little bit from that you know these were the first things we've done we've figured out what we want to do with the newer maps and the newer content and you know it's, it's really exciting for us now as we're pushing newer stuff out like we get more and more feedback every time we push a map out we get so many new players playing it in different perspectives and we learn a lot as well as you know everyone getting a good game to play as well so we're taking all this stuff that we're learning and we're either going to try our best to implement it into the old maps but realistically i think what's probably going to happen is we'll probably start them fresh which is kind of a bit of a scary thing but it's it's one of those things where that's perfectly normal thing to do in a development game cycle it's usually better to start fresh rather than trying to shoehorn stuff in on an already broken kind of system so yeah absolutely i mean nothing set in stone yet we'll see what happens but yeah like definitely for sure like the older maps hotel farm port they are not up to scratch with the newer content that we're creating and we're definitely going to address them we honestly just can't leave them in there like the state that they're in right now because they're so different from sort of like the newer content that we're bringing out where it's just way more refined it's way more polished we've got our set of rules we've got new gadgets and you know ways of playing the game that are just not in those older maps that we definitely need to bring up to current standard yeah for sure i still miss that hotel lobby though Oh yeah, there's definitely definitely parts of the hotel map which like you, you know I I built sort of like 95% of it and yeah like it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and one thing that I really love about hotel is the fact that it is so big that you can just kind of like if we decided to corner off certain routes depending on which mission type you're doing and that way you kind of see all the hotel but not all in one playthrough trying to trying to achieve all of that in one playthrough is kind of crazy like it's so big and there's just so much going on but it does it does allow us to have like so much much room for exploring different you know routes and game modes and you know playing with the ai in that kind of space as well so yeah there's definitely a lot to be done with this yeah hotel was a great map to work on as well like it's got such character yeah going back to the original actual question <laughs> figure we, we really want to handle this fun <laughs> yes there will be there will be planning um and it is planned and being actively worked on right now yeah for sure hopefully hopefully gosh i don't know if i'm allowed to say this hopefully soon as in like the next big <laughs> If all goes well, um, yeah. that would be ideal for us to have it there because the loadout is kind of the first big UI thing. Planning yeah. and, and briefing is the next big UI thing that we have in, in the hopper. So. Yeah, I mean, collectively, like, as a team sort of mentality as well, as like, we care about the quality of this game. We're not just going to, you know, push it out if we're not happy with it. It's it's something that we're actively working on, but we're not going to just throw it out and hope yeah. it works. Like, no, we'll, we're going to make sure that we're happy with it. Because we're also trying different ways of communicating this kind of stuff as well. Like, we were talking about having drawings on napkins and blueprints and stuff like that. We've also even tried with having, like, a fully realized 3D city where you'd kind of be, you know, accessing it as if you were potentially, like, sort of meta flying around in a helicopter looking down on the city we're not convinced that works but it's still we've got it we're experimenting with it we'll pick which one works for us in the context of the game and its themes and you know the, the best way to communicate these ideas of way as well so yeah we're definitely not sort of like just picking the first thing that comes to our mind and going with it we always like to experiment with a few different ways of achieving the end goal and really just finding out what works for everyone in every scenario kind of thing always a team effort yeah, on the same end of that, we don't want to like push things off for too long because we want things in there that we want when we play too. Even like with the loadout, things just keep changing until it gets to a place. I always look at everything as kind of like the first pass, the first version. So, because there's a point where we're like, all right, it works, it's functional, it's not, you know, it's not bad. It's got the things we want, it could use more. Let's get it in because we, we want to play with it, you know. Let me just chime in here for about a second. So, two things really stood out to me in this conversation. At this current moment, Ready or Not doesn't have a planning or briefing phase, at least in its current public form. And one of the devs referenced 
Baron Swap 4's briefing phase, which in my opinion is top tier because it describes the mission in a way that sounds like it's a story but also gives the player an idea of what you should bring into a mission. Like whether you want to go heavy or light, it also gives a lot of backstory as to what may have gone down during the events before you arrived. It allows the player to spawn in two different places of the same map. It's just a really good briefing phase but um, my biggest issue with it is that it didn't really have a way to actually mess with the map. Like it would show you a map but you couldn't like manipulate it or anything and like the developer said some of the maps in SWAT 4 weren't the exact same map like you literally see like a piece of toilet paper with a poorly drawn map on it and you just have to go off of that. I mean I really like that feature but I kind of wish that you could actually just like manipulate it and draw on it and stuff. That's the one thing that SWAT 4 didn't really have like a planning phase but their briefing phase was top tier. So I really got to say about that. When it comes to remaking maps I look at it as like a good thing and a curse because while I think a majority of their maps do look good they end up getting rid of some of the better maps that I actually liked like um, I don't know if you've ever heard me complain about this but I really dislike the proportion of the current gas station I think that the gas station in the previous update was just so much better looking and made more sense than this current one at least in my opinion another reason why it could be a curse is because these developers I feel feel take just a little too long on remaking maps over and over again. For example, during the time when the multiplayer was actually active, they kept remaking that one map, goddamn, where it's just like a big building in the middle, but they kept remaking it and remaking it and remaking it and then eventually scrapping it. So it was like, well, what was the point? The map that was at Dreamhack, I thought was really good, but then they remade it and I thought, oh, it's okay. And then they remade it again and they added like a gigantic base basement and then they remade it again and they there was no basement there anymore they just completely took it out and added a bunch of like stuff to the outskirts i mean i think it's cool that they remake maps but i feel like it takes them just a bit too long but i mean that's just my opinion a majority of their maps are pretty good but i do feel like they take just a bit too long on them not trying to discourage them in any way because they do make good maps although someone argued that they feel a bit too big i don't mind that their maps are big it's just i hope they keep their close quarters close quarters because this is supposed to be like a close quarters game right always in hallways but that's all i really got to say about this what's on the next thing have there been any thoughts on creating some sort of system to indicate or hint towards the direction of the final objective because you know it's always a bit obnoxious when you're stuck trying to find that one last civilian who's running around somewhere yeah absolutely there's a uh, zach is always working on the sound stuff he's working on a uh, sound occlusion and you know so if you hear you know a civilian walking above you or doing something like that you'll you'll be able to tell directionally where these people are now and uh i don't know about the items but i know that you know characters and hostages will be making noises through the walls and through the roofs and you know all this type of stuff so yeah definitely gonna work on stuff like that is there yeah. oh, is oh, there any sorry. ideas for <laughs> for four items like the meth i'm not sure about the item somebody will so i have to answer that i just know that zach is working on stuff like sound occlusion through walls so it's, it'll be easier to find you know last suspects and slash uh last civilians and hostages uh i can probably jump on with the item stuff um it's again we're not, nothing set in stone right now but we've, we've talked about a couple of ideas where at the same time we don't want to make it super easy for the player because we're just not that kind of game so the idea of having some kind of hood or reticle that kind of points you in the right direction that, that's not really there for us uh, so one thing that we were talking about at one point is maybe potentially like if you've been playing it for a while and you know you're still struggling to find that last objective we might have sort of like tight tangential clues that may or may not come in through the radio as a working example like we still want it to feel grounded like you're in this scenario so the idea of having any kind of like a hood I think is going to sort of like take the player out of that scenario there's a ton of stuff that we can do with the walkie-talkie and the mic on the um, on, on, on the player character as well where maybe there'll be like hints that come in or just general chatter between the SWAT officers like oh you know maybe as a working example like you know on the meth house it'll be like oh it comes in that intel you know that there might be a meth location on the second floor or something like that so just kind yeah, of guides even, maybe even the suspects yelling stuff out yeah for sure absolutely yeah like you know we want we want this to feel natural like it's happening in the world rather than that kind of gamified you know if you want to finish your quest follow the thing to get to your objective kind of thing so there's definitely a lot of things that we can do with this kind of stuff but at the end of the day we want it to feel like it fits within the world trying to find the balance of realism and practicality 
Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And I can also say that there will be no UI element that will point you in the right direction. HUD is going to always try to be as, as minimal as, as absolutely yeah, possible. Yeah, we're trying to be a hardcore shooter, so that's going to be as like minimal as possible. Waypoint yeah. markers might look a At little most, weird. At most, it'll be context clues to absolutely. really in game help stuff. guide you. Yeah, like uh, sprinkles of meth on the floor. <laughs> It's not only that, maybe. We've already got, yeah. like, tons of environmental storytelling, and I think a lot of, like, what would help as well is just refining that down. So it, it seems a little bit heavy-handed, but having a clue next to a light, it's a little bit heavy-handed, but it works, and, you know, it's a very clear visual mark of the play to go to this point. These are all things that we'll just refine the further we go down the line. It's where we are right now is we're just trying to, like, throw everything in and get it working and get sort of, like, the quality there that we want it to do, whilst figuring out, you know, how the game plays where we're going to put these objectives, you know, all these other different things that kind of stack on top of all that stuff. And then, yeah, we'll go through and refine that so it's just, like, the best kind of player experience that we can, like, get from all this stuff. Yeah, for sure. Like the uh, bathroom, you know, with all the meth on the shelves and everything, that's definitely an area you'd be looking for, you know, evidence. I don't know why, but them describing it kind of reminds me of the Easter holiday where you hide plastic eggs around your backyard or the park and let the little kids go and find them so that they can get the candy inside. I'm not sure why I thought about it like that, but I like the idea of them giving hints, especially if there's like a tweaker that's tied up and constantly looking where his stash is. That's kind of cool. But uh, I don't see that as like a big problem. Like, sure, it takes maybe like, I don't know, 30 minutes, just like walk around and see if I could find what I missed, but I usually find him in the end or that last piece of evidence. So I really don't see this as like a big deal if I'm being honest, but moving on. What balance do you take into consideration between that environmental storytelling aesthetics, just the way it looks in general and how it actually plays? Oh, that is a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there when you said balance, because it really is a balance. Like, you don't want to have just, like, crazy storytelling on every single wall, because if everything's cool, then sort of nothing's cool. And at the same time, we are making a game, and with making a game comes that sort of, like, visual language for the player when it comes to orientation of where they are on the map, what's the surface that they can walk on, where they can go, where they can't go. All of these things are really important, not just for a level designer, or as the artwork that then sits on top of it that has to have that visual communication as well so that's something that i i found is really just like the bread and butter of you know making good artwork it's not just about making it pretty and making it sort of like visually appealing but it's also having that communication with the player of what is gameplay space what is in gameplay space what's important you know leading the player where you want the player to go to have the more story impact is really important for me personally so one of my favorite maps and i'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the in the in the chat will probably agree as well is valley of the dolls that's that's a really good example of what we want to do more with our future maps and also what we want to put in the older maps where it almost like as you start playing this now just to kind of put a pin in that one of the biggest problems that we have with our games is the fact that you can have multiple sort of like routes throughout the levels and that's also in itself a huge challenge that i have to overcome where if i'm trying to lead a player down sort of like a visual storyline depending on where they're going if they can go anywhere that becomes like really really difficult so it's all about sort of like creating these little hints and you know i i, I love the idea of the the players maybe not even finding everything first time round. It's all a kind of like you see it on the surface and then you get closer and you know you'll read a note or you know you'll notice these different things on different playthroughs. And I think that's really, really rewarding for the player as well as having these multiple playthroughs and discovering more every single time. So we really want to push a lot of that stuff as well. So yeah, having that visual communication of sort of like right, it's really important for the player to know exactly where they are in the world at any point. We're probably going to struggle with some of this. Actually, we have struggled with this. I think Port was a very, very good example where I remember when I first started working on that because the, the tiered building that you go into, the warehouse, a lot of it is all quite samey and you didn't really know sort of like what floor you were on or what side the building you were on. So there was a lot of things I had to do with that to sort of like make that very, very clear to the player at any point in the game, you know, where they were spatially. So it's not all about just making it look pretty, but, you know, just having a conscious decision there about 
you know, something as simple as painting the walls a different color depending on what floor you're on. It's a very, very simple thing to implement, but it's super important for gameplay. And even though visually speaking, I'm like, ah, you know, I might not necessarily want a green wall when the other one's blue and, you know, I, I wanted that kind of coherency. Design is kind of king when it comes to that. Like, the design always comes first. So this is why when we're making our levels, we spend ages doing the block out first. You know, we really want to make sure that the space feels right, that, you know, the visual language of where the player can go, where they can't go, what is gameplay space, where the objectives are. And yeah, also using that to create the tension as well, because we've got so much tension in our game. The design is a real big impact on that. Like if, if you're playing it in a gray sort of block out stage and it feels right, you're already doing great. But if you're playing that and it doesn't feel right, there's really no point trying to put artwork on top of it because it's not going to fix the initial problem. So yeah, I, I work very, very closely with the level designers to make sure that when I put the artwork on top, it's also going to be serving the purpose from both a gameplay standpoint, but also is going to be working from a visual standpoint as well. Like there's definitely cases where, you know, I've turned around to the designers and I've been like, look, I don't know what this is supposed to be. Like from an architectural standpoint, it maybe doesn't make sense. Or, you know, we've got all this different stuff and I'm like, wow, how can I physically put this in here? Like, it doesn't make much sense. So that's a challenge in itself. And, you know, half of what making games really is, is just kind of like refining ideas down until you get the kind of core things. A lot of it's compromise. A lot of it's just like, you know, shoehorning stuff in to make sure it works correctly. <laughs> to kind of go back to my original point, sorry for getting a little bit sidetracked. Yeah, like balance is king. So it's not all about just making everything pretty. But what I personally really like to do is find these key areas within the map that create it's almost like a cinematic composition, whether that be going up a staircase in Valley and you get that beautiful, you know, sunset in the distance. And it sets a very different mood to the player, and, you know, and then you go further through the level and you start seeing all these different kind of creepy clues and stuff like that. And then there's the notorious basement, which I really, really wanted to just hammer home like this. Wow, this is not an okay thing that's happening right now. And, you know, the deeper you go, the worse it gets. So Valley is a really good example of where, you know, you can enter the basement from either direction, but I really, really wanted that shocking room to have one entrance where I was telling the story from a kind of, like, director standpoint, and the player was on that ride through that space. Now, obviously, the rest of the map, you can go wherever, that's absolutely fine, but, yeah, it's like, we have these moments where, you know, if we did that room everywhere, then it wouldn't be as impactful. So, it's not about just shock for shock value, and it's not about contrast just for contrast sake. It's all about finding that right balance to have good gameplay, good visuals, um, clear gameplay. That's the most important thing is if you can't see anything, then, you know, that's not okay. But it's finding that balance of, you know, these night maps, they're dark, which works with gameplay. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the player can, you know, see where their objective is and where they're meant to be going and, you know, just kind of lead them around the level as we want, you know, as intended kind of thing. Yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I think like sometimes when I do a concept for a level, mainly I'm thinking about the aesthetic, not really the design for like gameplay or whatever. So like, how does it make you feel? And one example for that is uh, Penthouse. I was doing a lot of the pre-visualization for that level. And uh, I was kind of going with a modern look, kind of brutalist architecture, very neutral color palette with gray, black, white, that type of thing. And ultimately that sort of evolved into sort of a 70s aesthetic. And that type of thing is pretty common. You know, a lot of the time the designers have like a better idea than what you had envisioned beforehand. And, you know, they just completely make it really pretty. I got uh, sidetracked on those burgers on dolls. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, Rapolio made an excellent point as well, where one thing that I can safely say as well, it's like what I would consider one of Void's best strength, is that everything that we do is a completely open floor to everyone on the team. So I'll be working with maybe Zach, the audio guy, and I'll be like, oh, you know, I, I need something here that's not working, or, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pitch him an idea, and he'll be like, yeah, that's amazing. Or, so it's completely a collaborative effort where I don't think we've ever had like a single individual level that hasn't had such a huge input from everyone on the team where we you know we've even changed entire art direction as Robley was saying you know, penthouse visually started off very very different and through the team's input and you know various different conversations looking at references even just kind of what we were feeling or what we wanted the level to feel like it just you know evolved into what it is right now so yeah I think I think that's definitely one of Void's strengths where it is completely a team effort it's not like you know me as environment I never shoot anyone down in terms of ideas like I love like more ideas the better kind of thing absolutely and it's not just level design here this isn't every department which i really enjoy like everything is a team effort even in audio departments it's so 
it's so uh, understanding and it's just an amazing work environment. Yeah, no one really works in a in a vacuum on this team. It's a flat management. Everyone just sort of like helps and, and pipes in and shares. Me and Zach are ideas. always coming up with ideas. It's 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 always amazing working with Zach and coming up with new sound ideas for the guns and how uh, everything just functions in the game audio wise. It's just the work environment at Void is something I've never really experienced before. It's such a relaxed place to work and it's amazing. Yeah, I, I come from you know I started modding back in like 2004. So it was like working the mod. Yeah, I started in 2012. Stuff. Yeah, it's so much like working on like a professional mod team. Like it's Absolutely. it's pretty awesome. Um, it's an amazing. Tomorrow. Or like my uh, you know when I was working on like insurgency NWI the like early the first insurgency days everyone just kind of has a role like in everyone wears multiple hats sterling's always just encourages people like oh you, you want to try something go for it <laughs> so it's it's pretty cool yeah for sure uh i mean you know, just kind of jump on that as well i know we're getting way off topic in terms of uh, the, the, the question but no like I've, I've worked all over the goddamn place I've, I've been on various different AAA projects now for like 14 years various different AAA studios and things like that avoid for me is incredible like you know just having such an inspired team you know like we said no one works in a vacuum just everyone is you know they turn up they're passionate no one has to tell them to do anything everyone's just contributing everything they can to make the best game they can and that is just so awesome as a game developer everyone in the company is fully remote do you feel like that actually has any negative impact on development or do you think it absolutely maybe even not. helps absolutely not because uh i've never met anyone in this team in person and it hasn't affected my performance or anyone else's at all i think it's redundant it doesn't really make a difference yeah for me, for sure at least. i mean I, I can definitely see the other side of that where you know just to completely play a devil's advocate here i get it studio culture is a thing some people are built to work from home some people aren't like i am for instance built for working home like i've got no problem I've got my setup, I, you know, I turn up, I crack on, etc, etc. But, you know, I've got friends who are just like, no, 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 I need to be in an office, I need to go somewhere, I need to do all that kind of stuff. I, th I feel very fortunate to be working with Void Interactive. You know, you don't have to tell them to turn up on work, they just do it. And I would argue that the fact that we are all working from home and we're all in different time zones, it's a bit of a blessing and a curse, but the wheel never really stops. So, like, what is my sort of, like, normal work hours and, you know, I'll, I'll clock off and, you know, start having fun in the evening. I'll still be on Discord on my phone checking updates and, you know, because I'm really curious about what the rest of the team's working on and it's yeah, the first sure. thing i do when i wake up is i check my phone what the discord is and i come on so it's it's a blessing and a curse like it never stops um, yeah but there's no clock depends. in clock out time <laughs> yeah. yeah people will be talking and i'll like roll over in the middle of the night check my phone and see you know, like a message yeah right. i mean people pop in and out wake up in the morning and I yeah that i got a message it's, it's, <laughs> such, <laughs> it's such a cool place to work because you just you don't really have to worry about it you just you know, you see people in the staff voice, you jump, you jump in, they're talking about, yeah. you know, planning and everything. It doesn't feel like you're working somewhere. It feels more like a group of friends. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. it's what I was saying. It's like a mod team. That's like a professional mod team. It's just passion based. Like everyone's just having a And that's what keeps us running too, is passion. Yeah. It's like, it's the main thing, making something good for everyone to play and making sure it's people, polished. People don't want to stop working. Like, you know, you have an office and everyone's going in nine to five and then we're then five's done. They're like, I'm out. Like I'm yeah. checked out. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Here people get to wake up and you want to do your game in the morning and then you start working like whatever it is it fits your way and so you feel more inclined to just work whenever yeah you know? yeah 100 percent the feeling strikes you you just want to work yeah and especially because of covid as well like i think the entire games industry as a whole had a little bit of shake up during covid where you know suddenly everyone was first to work from home and like i was saying before like that worked for some people that didn't work for some people but i think it definitely changed sort of like how we think about developing games now and now obviously we've been going for a little bit longer than covid was a thing but for us it never really it, it didn't change anything it was just like oh yeah like our average day just doesn't change like whether there's a pandemic going on or not like we had this amazing workflow where yeah we don't mess around we turn up we work we're passionate about it and yeah like it's not uncommon for us to be just working outside of hours because we want to do it not because we're forced to do it not because we're crunching not because of any other reason than the fact that we want to be here and we care about making games and we want to make the best game we can really yeah and like we still try to keep it social we will talk a lot in dev chat but also maybe just idle in a voice chat and people jump on and just talk while we work and i think some great ideas even come from that as we just brainstorm and shoot the shit oh for sure yeah yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to be very exciting because a couple of us are going to Gamescom this year and it's going to sort of be the first time we realistically meet collectively in person. So that's going to be quite interesting. I had no idea about that. That's crazy. Working remote also kind of helps it make it feel, when it's something you enjoy, it makes it feel more like a hobby than it does absolutely. a job because you're not having to commute. You don't have to wake up at a certain time that's super strict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for real. Like that's something I really enjoy about doing this 
you know, I, I work a real life job too. And, you know, I wake up every, you know, every day after work and I'm just like, damn, got to go back to work. But, you know, I don't feel that way when I'm working on this. It's a completely different feeling. It's like something I want to do. And it helps my part of being in this game is something I started out as a hobby. You know, it, it's it's a, a completely different experience when you're doing something you enjoy as a job. Yeah, for sure. I mean, mental health is such an important part of, you know, making good games. Like, happy artists make good games. So, yeah, the fact that we can pick up and put down and take care of ourselves whenever we need to super important yeah you don't feel like you're just tracking the hours you're not doing anything like that really you just work like to whatever works for you and i know for me sometimes i just need to step away from what i'm doing to yeah, get yeah. myself time to kind of forget what i was doing because i stare at it so long that all i see is flaws and i can come back to a fresh eyes um or the times i'll play similar games and just think about what they do right and wrong yeah, and that, then come to it whenever i'm ready and it's, it's amazing hard to do that in an office because you do feel like people walking around being like, what the hell is this guy? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I got you. I get it. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, and that's another thing, you know, doing contract base, you know, you don't really have to clock your hours either. That's something I really like about contracts. And, you know, hourly salary is something I don't like logging. So doing yeah. contract, you don't have to worry about that. You just have a set rate and you file it in and you get paid. So it's a lot better than having to clock in, log hours, do a timer, all this other stuff. It's just Yeah, easier. for sure. And it's better for the game because we almost always work more than and yeah, what we're getting yeah. paid to do. Absolutely. Sterling, he's our boss. He, you know, he's the guy running the thing, and it's easy to just to kind of forget that sometimes. It's just, yeah, for real. It's like he just he's, he feels like more just than a friend. Like he's just, <laughs> it doesn't feel like a boss at all. So he you just, just feel like, like you're like, oh, I want to do this guy a solid. Like, yeah, I'll just yeah. talk about it right now. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Like, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. I'm not the only one. From what I've seen in the maps that I played in Ready or Not, Void's storytelling is pretty blunt. There really isn't, like, room for interpretation. Sure, it's environmental storytelling and not really narrative, but you can definitely paint a picture with everything that they're giving you. It's pretty on the nose, in my opinion. Now, I'm not saying that the story has to be stellar or anything like that, but I think what really matters is the gameplay and the things that are going on around you is just more of a bonus, in my opinion. Like, they say that they don't want to do it for shock, but I can't think of a single reason why you would do the neon nightclub unless it was for shock like as far as i can tell there's really no story there there's just a couple of assholes that just wanted to raid a nightclub for some reason maybe because they were bored like i don't know like if you're gonna do storytelling then maybe say that there was like some sort of dispute between the owners of the club and some sort of gang in the area and one of the best ways to portray that to the player is there's actually a security room that's inside of the club like if the player really wanted to find out what actually went on behind the scenes he could go into that room and watch a couple of conversations between the bad guys and the guys that were the owners of the club and watch the dispute play out it'll play out something like this listen i don't mind bringing drugs into my club but this shit is wrong putting people in cages and having them it just doesn't work out for me and that's where the dispute begins right there as the bad guy keeps insisting and insisting that they use trafficking victims to the point that the club owner gets pissed off and tells him to get out of his club and he has security come in and escort him out but the gang member is like wrong move and a fight breaks out between the security and the gang and the gang just overpowers the security because the gang has freaking AKs and he could also use the same footage to point out where drugs are hiding as a hint or find the trafficking victims that they have on the scene still locked in cages they couldn't leave because they wanted to take over the place but obviously they couldn't do it quietly you could also find out why the bad guys were there to begin with maybe it's because it's like their most ideal place to put their trafficking victims and also getting a little use out of them as dancers you know but that's just what i would do maybe they already have something planned and i'm just like out of the loop but yeah so they said that they were going to gamescom i wonder if they're going to show anything off that's pretty cool it also seems like void interactive has a pretty good work environment which is pretty good you never want to have your devs in a place where they stress but it also kind of explains the tardiness when it comes to them not hitting their dates or time frames that they put out but anyways let's get back to it so what are some of the biggest challenges you guys face throughout your entire time with void working on ready or not or just recently keeping my sounds up to par with the current you know generation of this this game industry is, is something i've been struggling with you know my warfare 2019 has set a bar for weapon sound design and i've I've actually struggled personally keeping my sounds on par with that and it's just always a challenge. I'm used to classic old Counter-Strike sounds and obviously we can't do that anymore because it's not really appeal with all these new weapon reflections and echo systems we have in place so I, I, that's my biggest challenge is keeping my sounds up to date and being satisfying to the ear. I kind of started or like got into the games industry when I was kind of young. I think I was like a junior in high school when I first joined the team so it was kind of crazy learning a lot. Like I had never done concept art before or UI or anything like that and you know 
people would just come up to me and it's like, hey, you're a 2D artist, can you do this? And I'd say, sure. You know, I'd never say no. I'd never turn down what they asked of me. And I think that kind of motivated me to just keep doing better, keep learning, just keep growing as an artist, especially in concept art. I think I started that, I don't know if I mentioned that, but like two, two-ish years ago. So it's been really cool just learning all these different techniques of designing characters and environments. Yeah, it's really interesting and fun. Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, we've got so much content that we're trying to produce and we're a very, very small team. I know like for so many other developers, it would be so easy to just kind of do a few maps, very, very simple, very, very basic, click the paycheck, go home. We're not even thinking about that. We just want to make as much content. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're doing this for the players. You know, everyone who supported us has sort of made this happen. So we very much want to give that back, but we're such a small team and trying to keep up with the quality of massive AAA studios who have thousands of people working on, you know, certain titles and dedicated teams to solve certain problems. That for us, uh, well, for me personally, is a really, really big challenge. Like we don't, as a working example, we don't strictly have a dedicated lighting artist. Every, any, any of the lighting is something that I also do myself. And, you know, I know Sterling jumps on occasionally and we all kind of support each other. It's not for like a trying the games industry is also in a weird flux where it's really hard to find senior developers these days they've just kind of dried up i think because of covid and various things like that so we're a very very small team trying to make an astonishing amount of content also trying to make it as triple a quality as we can despite the fact being a tiny indie team there's a lot of things to juggle and you know trying to do all of that as well as have it you know optimized so everyone can play it there's a lot of wheels turning so yeah i think like sort of like the biggest challenge for me is just trying to get everything out on time we want to keep maps coming out to the public as much as we can so you know every couple of months take a level from gray block out to a final finished state with all the visuals all the new models and all the new textures we basically hand make everything yeah there's a few things that we buy on the marketplace every now and then and for sure you know there's the quicks library which is very useful to lean on every now and then but there's so much in our game which is just so bespokely made and yeah like that stuff takes time and it's a lot of effort and it's it's great doing it, but that's a struggle, you know? The game's constantly evolving and changing, and so even UI requirements. So what will exist with data that I can get, but also need a plan for data that we don't have yet that we want to have later on. So I'm pretty much starting from the ground up with the different UI things to take the systems that existed and set them up in a way that I can use them now for new things and then also plan for what, what we want to done in the future you know, in terms of like a web and customization or something like that. I'm trying to think about ways to present that to players that are pretty UX friendly. I think one of the biggest challenges was setting up the whole way the armor slots and munitions work because you think you want to have that set to work on based on the weapon itself, but that weapon doesn't decide your carrying capacity. So we had to like really think about what we have available, what we need, uh, put in requests for uh, specific things to be supplied to us so that we can set all that up and make sure all saves properly. Then you never know, something might change and we need to completely rework that and so you have to deal with the fact that you know people might lose their settings their their save loadouts or anything like that but it's a blessing too because when things are constantly evolving you have the ability to influence the way they're going to go the ability to change something that you've done wrong or to improve something that just could be better overall what does it mean to be AAA in this day and age is it over monetization unfinished half-baked buggy games that are a mess or elden ring red dead redemption metro exodus it takes two etc i'll let you decide that in the comments but also why the frack do my settings reset after each update explain void are there any plans for more graphic voice lines that's something i'm hoping for i'm not exactly sure if it's planned but i've talked to zach about getting these lines more you know graphic and vulgar because during situations like this you're not really calm you're screaming you're disoriented you don't know what's going on you got a lot going through your head so you know you're not exactly filtering out your language you're just pretty much saying what comes to mind so i think this is a good idea i, th I like this uh it's something i've been hoping for at least yeah for sure but we don't want to be vulgar just for the sake of vulgar as well like it, it needs yeah, to feel absolutely. grounded we're gonna get a full complete overhaul of our SWAT voices, but that will come uh, closer to full release, I think. So they'll react to the environment a lot more, you know, like they see something that's pretty horrible, they'll let you know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the voice lines have definitely gotten better. They're not as goofy as they used to be, but they're not as vulgar as they say here. They could definitely amp that up just a little bit. Not saying that I want them to be like that, but I think that it would make sense that, you know, you're going up against someone that's probably bigoted or racist, or maybe has different worldviews that he's trying to tout to you as he's shooting at you 
and it would definitely be interesting to see what would happen if you picked a uh, black character model and all of a sudden you hear <laughs> and all of a sudden you notice the difference in tone if you know what I'm saying I'm not saying that it should be a thing but I'm just saying it's realistic and probably does happen but anyways are there any plans to do a rework of the HQ yes uh, I can confirm that that is definitely something that we're planning as well this ties into exactly what I was saying before where we started to where we are now it's almost like two different games and we're just not happy with the quality and sort of the layout of the original HQ so we want to tie that HQ into more of what our current vision for the project is you know we've got such a rich story and we've got such a so much personality within the city and all these different levels we want to inject more of that absolutely yeah and also bring everything together in a sort of smarter way because like right now a lot of the rooms and uh you know like the shoot house is downstairs well i mean the um the firing range is downstairs and stuff so it takes a while to move from place to place and kind of condensing it down i think it'll be a more enjoyable experience yeah i, I definitely agree with that there's a bit too much traversal required <laughs> To, to get to the different important parts in the HQ. So I think it's as long as I've you know been around, the HQ is always uh, more of a placeholder for something better to come. The game really does feel like two different games. If you've played the initial release of the alpha compared to now, it's literally day and night. Even the gameplay and gunplay is different. I actually do prefer the original alpha's gunplay and gameplay because it was a lot like Insurgency Sandstorms, but I'm not saying that the current one is bad or anything. You know, I feel like it's just right for this type of co-op gameplay I think it definitely works but yeah it really does feel like two different games like if you look at the initial trailer the hotel was so much brighter than the current one like almost every map in ready or not that I played is ridiculously dark and different from their original counterparts so yeah another thing is that I actually did have a video coming out on the HQ and what it might look like but I don't know if I should release it now I mean I'm already editing it so I might just release it anyway but because I did discover a couple of things that might just get thrown out after so I'm definitely gonna probably still do it most likely but I'm curious to see what the newer version of HQ is gonna look like some of the maps seem to feel a little bit maybe too big or too much for the amount of players you get combined with how much ammo you have so things like hotel raid is this done for a reason or is this something that's gonna be worked on or what yeah for sure I mean this is all part of you know making games we'll never no matter how hard you try you'll never make it perfect out of the gate so a lot of this is just finding that balance like I was talking about before where you know we experimented with sort of like what the game was going to be trying different things with different levels and sometimes it works sometimes it falls a little flat we'll do everything that we can to effectively bring everything up so not only does it look amazing but everything should play amazing everything is a balancing act when it comes to making games everything is a compromise and yeah just got to keep polishing it keep refining it and you know working with the designers and certainly working with the community as well and listening to this kind of feedback is invaluable you know we didn't necessarily have that when we were making it so we'll take all of this stuff find our weak points and 100% improve them yeah so i think it comes down to play style too i know i prefer myself the larger maps while there's like the smaller more condensed maps i think there's something to just having a the link and more anticipation of what's going to happen having to be a little bit more conservative with your choices and your ammo so different changes challenges there too and making sure that we have the gamut of options for our players for the ones that do prefer those long drawn out levels versus ones that like the close quarters very quick smaller scenarios oh definitely yeah and we definitely love the idea of of like almost like forcing the players to experience the game in different ways that they might not have initially thought that they would have experienced. You know, having day maps, night maps, close quarters, long range, larger maps, smaller maps, where you've got to change up your player styles. You know, it keeps the player on their feet, keeps it engaging, keeps it active. And yeah, it's all about just finding that balance. And yeah, we definitely want variation in our game, you know. Otherwise, we just make 50 different hotel maps and that wouldn't be enjoyable for anyone. You know, we want to have as much spice and flair to our different levels as we can yeah i think definitely having variety between small medium and large maps and also keeping them visually distinct each having their own vibe and aesthetic you know i never really had an issue with the maps from ready or not for the most part i think that they're actually pretty good well aside from uh, gas station i dislike the proportion but i mean i still think it's a good map i just prefer the older one but i think my biggest issue with these maps is that they don't give you enough options to go about the maps like you're always gonna start in the front and you usually push in. I mean, there is like a garage area, but I would also like to be able to come in from the backside or use the tactical ladder to like put it up against a window and hop through there or come in from a helicopter on the top of the roof or something. Like that would be cool. But that's just my opinion. What are your thoughts? Let me know down below.
below. How exactly are weapon sounds created? Sound libraries and recordings I've actually recorded myself and edited in post. Most of the uh, gun folly sound effects are me fiddling with my gun. The uh, SLR is actually a recording of my AMD 63 AK style rifle. The bolt is from directly from that gun being recorded. But uh, I also utilize a ton of assets from, uh, you know, universal sound libraries recorded by people that actually record weapons in a professional environment. I'm not professionally able to record stuff like that yet, but I have a little studio. I'm able to record folly effects and reloads and gun firing is not something I'm capable of right now. So I'm kind of utilizing what I can in that aspect. But all the uh, handling effects and reloads have samples I've recorded myself. The gun sounds are ready or not sound pretty good i wouldn't say that they're the best that i've heard that definitely goes to insurgency sandstorm but they're not that bad navarro has definitely done a pretty good job for what he's got and i hope it continues to improve in the future because i do feel like a lot of the guns are samey but i mean for what it's worth it's still pretty good but anyways will there ever be the option to change a level's day or night cycle no unfortunately not so this is something that we toyed around with at first we found out that it didn't really offer a huge amount to the level in terms of like its gains versus its pitfalls so at the end of the day we want to make very concise authored levels to the best of their quality and to tell a story in within these you know very very condensed kind of areas having that kind of flexibility of turning it to day and night whilst it can be done from a pure production standpoint first of all it doesn't add a huge amount and because we are a fully baked lighting game so what that means is like most of our lighting is done off Offline, it's not happening in real time, other than a few exceptions like spotlights and torches and various things like that. It's way more performance and it's also way more uh, quality as well. So all of our lighting is pre-baked into the levels. Now, we definitely could do this, but what that means is that we would inherently have to either duplicate the level and treat it like its own separate things. And we're also tied with the technology of Unreal 4. So we're not moving to Unreal 5. We're way too far in production at the moment to go UE5. Like this happens all the time in game dev where, you know, if you're middle of a project, you do not just switch engine that's just chaos like you can't do it kind of thing so we're gonna you know stick with unreal uh, 4 which is still incredibly powerful and in a lot of ways it's way more suited for what our game needs are than unreal 5 is anyway it's still very much early days for unreal 5 so we have baked lighting and it's all very you know we wanted to author it from a visual standpoint to tell the story that we wanted to tell so what you'll find playing our levels as you go further on um, in development and as we start introducing new maps and tying a lot of the story beats in is that a lot of the time of day within these levels is very important to the storyline you know the weather effects the time of day it's all a like a narrative that ties into each other so we didn't necessarily want to have the flexibility of changing the time of day because it didn't really add a lot realistically speaking we have day maps we have night maps you have dusk maps there wasn't really adding a lot changing that per level if that makes sense just kind of bouncing off of that certain levels are like built around the time of day they're set in if meth were set in the daytime, it wouldn't have as big of an impact as if it was set in nighttime. And same will be for maps like school, you know, like certain time of day, certain weather conditions just wouldn't be suitable for that map. Yeah, for sure. It is literally just the fact that we're trying to tell a story and, you know, the whole gameplay mechanics is such a key aspect of it that if you start playing off the time of day, kind of waters it down, there's more things to go wrong from a developer standpoint and you're just not going to realistically get the quality that we sort of want from the end of the day. So it's just all about keeping them as in, like looking exactly as intended yeah exactly feeling yeah. exactly as intended yeah okay. yeah that's not to say that we couldn't toy with the idea but we would probably treat it as an additional after the fact and treat it separately kind of thing yeah i think the uh day and night is a huge impact on the level design I'm gonna have to give it to the developers here. The game doesn't need a day or night cycle. Maybe if it was like an open world, that would make sense, but this is a game where you go into a mission and then you're out once you're done. If they did want to mix it up, then they could definitely add a day or night map, switching it up just a little bit, just so that the maps don't always feel so samey. But it also kind of wouldn't make any sense because you're almost always inside, so you never really get to look at the sky. Now it's gonna be dark anyway because every building in Ready or Not has never heard of freaking lights, but that's just my thoughts. And another thing that they mentioned here is that they're probably not gonna move to Unreal 5 right away, which makes complete sense to me because any developer that I've talked to about switching up to the newest version of the next engine is always a freaking hassle. Like they have to make sure that everything works on the next version, which could take a long time to fix. So they're probably not going to do it until they make sure that everything is done or if they're even going to do it at all. But yeah, that's all I pretty much got to say about that. Let's move on. Will there ever be an option to enable disable mods in the lobby? That's hard to answer for me because I don't know anything about it. Sorry, we could just move on. We'll figure that out later. 
I was hoping uh, Mark would have something about that. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I do not understand mods. Uh, I am but a humble artist. I, I make things pretty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Different Absolutely. department. Yes. If Ollie was here, maybe we'd have an answer. Yeah. Yeah, that we'd need a, one of the programmers here to really answer yeah, that in terms yeah, of like what can That's none of us. Lobby. Don't have too much to say about this, but uh, it's good to see that Void Interactive is actually for mods. It's something that'll definitely keep their game going for a while, but uh, let's move on. Will there be a pass on Ragdoll incapacitation animations and SFX to go with those? Yeah, I mean, I can probably blanket statement answer a lot of these questions by just saying we're intending to improve every aspect of the game. There's nothing that we're shelving and being like, oh yeah, this is done. So yeah, anything that you can think of that you go, will X have more polish or improvement? Absolutely. Yeah, to add on that, uh, Zach and me were actually talking about body drop sounds not too long ago. So yeah, there's something definitely in the works there. I don't want to go too deep into detail, but yeah, like we have had some smaller conversations about it and it is definitely planned. Like you shoot someone in a certain part of the body, like the neck, for instance, and they'll kind of drop and they'll wiggle around or something. Sort of Screaming like how Brand Yeah, <laughs> and like... Hit a, you know, just hit an artery, blood yeah. everywhere. I've seen some clips that have been posted into ragdolls are crumpling and stuff. Things that might be coming. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we've yeah. implemented something that we didn't have before, which is the explosive vests. Naturally, that comes with the challenge of gore as well, because it's hard to not be gory when someone's exploded. No, absolutely. It's one of those things where we don't want to just shock people for the sake of shocking. <laughs> like, it's going to be realistic, and absolutely. Blood comes out of people, and it's fairly gory, and we'll, we'll do what we can to deal with it in a tasteful way that really, again, it's all about player experience within our game. Just to kind of jump on the ragdoll side of things as well, so I know it's not strictly ragdolls, but there's one thing that I want to get a lot more of in the levels and it's something that I am personally working on as well is having a lot more level interaction so, you know, a lot more things that when you shoot them, maybe they'll bounce around the room or, you know, burst particles or... It's, it's always one of those key pillars from an environment artist of having movement and interaction within your environment to make it feel alive and lived in and, you know, a lot of our levels at the moment are fairly static. We know about it we're going to do something about it it's going to also change up the gameplay a little bit as well where you know maybe it'll be like a stack of papers on a table that someone's covering behind the papers will explode when you shoot them and then suddenly they're not behind cover anymore you know little things like that it makes a whole difference to you know how players play the game and things like that yeah and uh, i was in nda and i had a big conversation about interactive ragdolls interacting with the environment like you know grand theft auto 4 there was a whole entire conversation about that and i'm sure i'm not the only one who saw it i'm pretty sure a bunch of the programmers saw it too so there's probably definitely something going to be working on there. Again, I don't want to go too far into detail, but um, one thing we're kind of looking into is head deformation. So um, you shoot someone, depends on the caliber, I think, and there'll be like a preset head deformation that happens. So like the head will cave in or something. I don't know. It's still heavily work in progress, but you know, it's something we're kind of thinking of. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have such focused environments that it definitely lends into sort of like what our game is, where, you know, you use Grand Theft Auto as a working example, where they're a massive, massive game. They've got so many different systems and they have to cater for basically sort of like every scenario happening. And it's why a lot of it kind of amazing on the surface and then it kind of falls apart when you put them in a certain scenario. Our levels are so focused and so tight and it's so authored to exactly what we want them to be that we can just spend all of our time well, not all of it, but you know what I mean. Refining a lot of these things that just brings the immersion way up, whether it is, you know, someone touching a counter as they walk by. Not saying that we are implementing it or haven't implemented it, but it's definitely not out of the realms of possibilities of just being like, yeah, we know where this counter is, we know where the AI is and what they're going to do. We can have that interaction and, you know, just build upon it from there. A lot of people have sent me a bunch of stuff that they have considered cut content and asked me to do like a video on it, but the reality is, is that I have no idea if any of this stuff is actually cut or not like one of the developers says here there's nothing that they're shelving maybe a lot of the stuff that was before the december update that they're probably we working and we're just complaining about nothing at this point who knows they mentioned body dropping and gore here which is pretty cool i like how if you hit someone in the shoulder you know it's gonna jerk back their shoulder because that's where they got hit definitely a neat feature i would like to see and some gore they did show off like a little bit of gore like a very long time ago on i think their twitter or instagram one of the two but one of the suspects that's just shot and like the freaking neck and then he just starts bleeding out you see him like slowly falling on the floor i remember that's pretty neat hopefully we see some more of that what is your guys favorite part of actually working on the game or like what was your favorite thing as well in the past even like favorite addition favorite map favorite feature something like that for me is uh 
the satisfaction of getting those sounds lined up with the reload it's something for me that's always my favorite thing and working with everyone is also something i really love like everyone is like i said before everyone's just in a team effort here and it's just an amazing environment so uh, the so actual the team then for you yeah pretty much i am really proud of my work on the guns in this game not to uh boast or anything but i think i've done my best work i've ever done on this game yeah i mean absolutely it sounds a little bit weird me saying this but i'm very much looking forward to the future we've improved everything so much in the last couple of months and we've refined our vision and you know we've proved as people in terms of like how we've upped our skills so everything that's going to come is going to be the best thing that we've done and i'm really looking forward to that so easy to look back in nostalgia and be like oh you know this is this is amazing because i did it one thing that i will happily say is that we're always improving so we're never stopping so there's none of that looking back and being like yeah this is amazing leave it alone it's like nah the future's exactly where everything's gonna be yeah i think my favorite part is seeing a character or a map being designed from the ground up and then seeing it finally implemented in the game seeing it start from a concept and then block out and then like all the art being added to it over time is really satisfying to see yeah i always like that it's one of my favorite things just to see how things uh, build upon themselves themselves and, and get better and better as they go so level designs it's always nice to i mean i'm usually just in like a ui test level or <laughs> most half the time anywhere i'm doing the loadout i'm just sitting in the station just launching it jumping the loadout stuff like that so i'll jump in the game and i'll just see how drastically a level's changed and it's pretty shocking but always always really cool so seeing people always praise your work is like something that just makes you feel great and you know you did a good job and people enjoy it it's something that is just it is unmatched yeah oddly enough i've got a very specific key memory where I was testing the game and I didn't know that this was a feature at the time but I, I shot through a door thinking someone was on the other side and then I heard the, the groan of oh and then the plunk as they hit the floor kind of thing and I had to pause it and I, and I had to check in with myself and like realize like wow we implemented a feature that let us know we've hit someone on the other side of the door otherwise I wouldn't know I've killed someone and the fact that we as a team thought about it implemented it and it worked so efficiently that for me was just like a that is so awesome that is so cool like i want and need more of this in my life kind of thing yeah seeing concepts and you know block maps going to from that like that to actually in the game is something unmatched too it's it's just so satisfying to see something finally finished so the favorite part for overall is just kind of just seeing the entire game grow then yeah absolutely yeah, yeah that's a good way to put it the problem is like with, with ui it's I, i'm staring at it so long and i'm so intently that i usually am sick of it by the time that, you know i'll push it out so it's always great to see everything else that's going on around it that just changes and grows as opposed to just the you know maybe my my own stuff and once it gets in there because i usually am all i see is the problems with it so it's cool to step back and see the other things that people put together that they all, all they see is the problems with it but it's all new to me so it's really awesome and uh constantly praise going on in team chat when people would finally see what stuff's been committed and they're just blown away by it this is so awesome and it's it's always a cool feeling to see everyone do that to each other don't really have too much to say about this this is actually pretty cool to hear that they actually like doing what they're doing so let's continue are there any plans to add nonverbal communications such as shoulder tapping and hand signals excellent question we're toying with but at the same time we're not even sure how really to kind of communicate a lot of this stuff so for instance if you're breaching a door and someone behind you taps on your on the shoulder there's definitely like some trickery when it comes to like how do we communicate that from a gameplay perspective like obviously you're looking forward in your field of view you know we need to somehow like figure that out kind of thing maybe I guess is the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the challenges with just a user interface of working in a pancake game or any virtual environment. There's a lot of sensations that you have to make up for that you would have in the real world you know, where you can't feel someone squeeze your shoulder in the game. And so we have to communicate that in a way that doesn't feel gamey or... Screen shake. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but then we're like, was that a screen shake because something went off on that level? With so many different things you have to consider to make it clear. There's no question about it in real life. If someone squeezes your shoulder, your shoulder was squeezed. But in, in game, we want to do a way it's where you know, it's just as clear if we're going to have it. Otherwise, it could get a little bit confusing and nonsensical and nobody will end up using the feature that we might have spent a lot of time to implement because there's a lot that goes along with that. Everything from the animations properly touching the shoulder where it's supposed to touch depending on the height of that character. Different things like that. But if nobody ends up using it because it just isn't effective, that wouldn't be really worth it. But 
I do know we're constantly looking at all those kinds of things and trying to get as close to that realism as we can, or at least the perceived realism. That nonverbal communication would just be just really cool to feel like when you actually get it going good. Yeah, it would be awesome. It really could be cool since like voice, it's always pretty much one level. No one's really whispering in that. We're trying to speak quietly. So I have some sort of nonverbal communication in the game beyond just maybe hand signals or something like that would be really cool and probably a first. But if we can't figure out how to communicate it properly, then it's not going to really pan out. Like a a wheel could probably work, wouldn't it? A moat wheel? Yeah, it's just about like you're the person whose shoulder's being touched. How would you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the best way to do that is a sound and a screen shake. Yeah, like like a pat sound. Um, yeah, on that yeah. speaker or something like that. But I'm down for it. I think it's awesome. It's just about yeah, it's a good idea. The user experience is there and justifies the amount of work that I have to go into. Like all that yeah, so. and you also got to take in the fact that it could be used against you know people trying to play the game like they want to. It could be used in a negative way. Yeah, yeah there's always gonna be trolls that'll do something with it. <laughs> Tap on the shoulder would be really cool, and to negate the trolliness, you could definitely make it so that it only prompts when you're near a door. I'd definitely love to see it, and it would also be cool to have a lot of those features where you could like do a bunch of hand signals to your guys and stuff to try and do like a sneak playthrough that'd definitely be some sort of challenge for me i'll tell you what how many design iterations do levels actually go through uh it depends on the level we've had some good luck you know obviously we're a fairly small team of you know designers and environment artists where sometimes levels have just worked you know sort of like first or second polish out the gate just worked other levels we're talking months just trying to figure out how to get it just working and feeling right with the architectural style and what we're trying to communicate to the player and where it's set in the city and stuff like that so yeah honestly a lot of it is just it all depends sometimes it just works sometimes it doesn't we're doing a hospital map at the moment and i think a lot of those kind of hospital penthouse i know yeah, penthouse is a pretty quick one those kind of like interior levels where you have you know corridors and set rooms and they're all based around like a certain architectural style those tend to lean into development being quite quick from a block out standpoint because usually i just get a bunch of cubes where walls and doors go and i'm like yep that's fine i can absolutely work with that that's not a problem have something like farm on the other hand where it's a mixture of organic and there's tunnels and you know there's these um more like spanish influenced buildings and like country houses kind of thing a lot more things go wrong um you know with lines of sight and just trying to figure out how things work um so yeah entirely just depends on the level yeah i think like gas and hotel have gone through like four or five even six iterations i think originally when they were first designed they were designed based on look and not really gameplay so so, I mean, they would look pretty, but it would suck to play through. The layout and the way AI sort of interacted at the level yeah, just sure. kind of sucked. And so, you know, they were rebuilt, restarted. Yeah. So that kind of explains why some of the older maps have gone through so many iterations. Yeah. Pretty sure I've said this before, but one thing that I noticed about the Radio Not developers is that they will actually go back and redo a bunch of maps. Like, I remember the map that I played at DreamHack. It wasn't the same one that they launched with during the March multiplayer event. It was completely different, and then they changed it again and again and again, like I already said before. But I also think that they do take a long time on that type of process, but, I mean, if it helps gameplay, then, you know, it's whatever. But anyways. Will procedural prop generation ever be added this is an interesting one this is something that i have spoke about before and we've had this discussion probably not now the only reason why this is is it kind of ties back into what we were saying before about how we wanted to make this very focused set level no it's not a massive open world game where we need procedural systems to essentially fill in the content it's a very focused smallish kind of levels where we want to tell a very specific story and at the end of the day gameplay is absolute king if it doesn't work, if it doesn't feel right, it's not going to work for us as a game. Now, the moment that you start implementing sort of like procedurality of even even if it's set cover points where let's say you've got four or five different places in the game, in, in the level, where, you know, we can either turn cover on and all off or change the kind of cover. It can be done. Like, it's not exactly against the tech. Like, that's fine. It'll reduce in quality a little bit because that means that those assets aren't baked. There's a cost that comes with that with them being dynamic. The problem is, is that it kind of breaks the gameplay a lot. Even if it's tailored like 100% for every single one of these possible scenarios, it's not something that we can cater for every single time you play the game and it gets randomized. So probably not. 
Um, what we're more interested in is procedurally generating what the AI does and how it interacts with the environment. So instead of changing the environment around the AI, leaning in to the fact that the AI effectively has a brain and we want these characters to work within the environment. So whilst on one playthrough you'll have someone hiding under the bed, they might not be there the second playtime. They'll be in the wardrobe or wherever else. So it's effectively the same kind of system on its head in some ways. I kind of disagree. I think having levels randomly generated would make the level level more interesting and different every time like not only would you have AI that would spawn in completely different places but also the level on the inside would look a lot better in my personal opinion and it doesn't necessarily need to be like randomized like maybe just make three different versions of the same map with some stuff moved around that's kind of what zero hour does and it makes the map feel different every time leading me down a different path all the time I'm not saying that it's something that you need to do like right now but like maybe later on down the line when the game's more concluded have it as a DLC or something but anyways are we ever going to be able to actually give NPC suspect voice orders telling them to move walk outside or something like that can anyone answer that I don't think we've ever had that conversation oh well, I was talking to Sterling the other day we were playing a lot of door kickers door kickers 2 specifically and we were talking about how you're able to sort of command the hostages to do certain things like you know follow you or um, you know run to the exit and that type of thing so that would be kind of cool to have for suspects or civilians that have already been arrested and you're kind of able to command them that way so yeah okay yeah I mean heck if it makes the game better and it introduces new features, I think we can safely say that we're open to ideas and we're definitely eager to implement as much as we can within the time frame and within the budget that we have. So, yeah, maybe, maybe. It'd be nice to have the NPCs a uh, bit more interactable besides just cuffing and picking them up. Yeah, for sure. That would actually be kind of cool to make it so that you can actually order a civilian to like get over to your position or tell them to run to the exit, whether you want to do that with hand signals or, you know, just yelling at them or maybe even in a quiet tone just so that you don't alert bad guys. I would actually like them to run towards the spawn area so that I can go back there and just freaking cuff them when I get over there. That would be nice. Is there ever going to be a single player story or are the maps themselves kind of just the story itself entirely? <laughs> a little bit of yes, a little bit of no. So it's not like we're going to have like a traditional single player campaign kind of thing. Like the actual gameplay that you have right now is exactly what the game is kind of thing. We're not going to change that formula because that's what our game is. That's our formula. What we're doing is we're injecting story and its campaign almost like outside of that. So whilst it may seem like at the moment we have a bunch of random maps that have a bunch of random storylines going on, they are 100% tied to different story threads within the game. So we have like a prostitution ring storyline, there'll be like a terrorist storyline, you know, so forth and so on, all these different uh, drug smuggling storyline, etc, etc. So they will all tie into each other one way or another. I don't want to say it's not like a traditional campaign, like I was saying. It is absolutely happening as if like a campaign would play out with its narrative, with its like level progression and so forth and so on like that. Counter strike, condition zero, deleted scenes is what I'm getting from yeah, this. You can sort of think of it as like, I guess, sort of like detective work, kind of follow a lead throughout, like, you know, you start off with gas station, you discover something with meth is involved, and you sort of progress through that drug storyline, you know, same with the trafficking. Yeah, absolutely. So this entirely as well t ties back to what we were saying earlier about the whole day-night cycle as well, where if we take dealer and port as a working example, like they're on the same story thread. So yeah, you go to dealer, and within the world, we're going to have conversations and news articles and televisions talking about how there's a storm coming to the you know los suenos it's a little bit rainy and a little bit more damaged we're kind of working on this as well at the moment where we're implementing more of this prostitution ring the back of dealer there's you know a sex den and various things like that and that ties very directly in with port where you know you find evidence and you start connecting the dots as a player of okay so this is where these girls are getting shipped in on the cargo crates and things like that so you go to port and then we're implementing as we speak more of this rain more of this storm so that's going to be like actively happening whilst you're playing port so it makes sense from a kind of campaign stand that you play dealer first and then play port and yeah just you know one event after the other and it all sort of ties into each other quite nicely if you're someone that's followed this channel then you know that they're already saying stuff that we kind of already knew that a lot of the missions are going to be like linked together but it's interesting that they say that it's going to start with gas station is that going to be like the first mission i mean i think it definitely makes sense that the easier missions would be first and then the harder ones would come afterwards but it's cool to see that they're like reconfirming it for us anyway will the sniper role ever be implemented it's definitely something I, I'm a proponent of, so I guess it's just about seeing where things go. Because right now it's about the core SWAT uh, gameplay of, of moving through. 
and doing things. But you know, there's always that on the table that role as sniper. It'd be great yeah. to be able to see him set up in different areas. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people on the team want that to look in to the you know Overwatch and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely talked about. Yeah, you know, maybe for some levels and not all, because some of the levels just aren't particularly set up to support someone from the outside looking in, like for hotel, for yeah, instance. Hotel, yeah, I was about to say that's something I'm in support of. That's something I've been actually hoping for because I've uh, I want to make some sounds for a sniper rifle for sure. But yeah, like Dead Pixel said, we're primarily focused on the entry team and the SWAT officers themselves that actually entered the building. A lot of people really want that uh, something like the SWAT or sniper take control of. It was really fun for the sniper role. If they actually do bring it back, it was like a little mechanic that you could use in SWAT four, where there's like a sniper that tells you if you see someone and you have the option to shoot the guy with the sniper. If you were like in a gunfight and you couldn't see him, but the sniper could. So I hope that Ready or Not adds in that mechanic. But what I would also like to see is if they ever add in a planning phase, it would be really cool to have the option to set the sniper in like multiple locations instead of just one. That would be pretty cool. But anyways, Casual Center asked me, can you describe the process for weapons research? Is a big focal point for players on how they are added. To my knowledge, weapons are added based on what NA SWAT teams use. Can you go in depth with that? As far as I know, weapons for uh, the SWAT are relatively realistic, but you know, the SLR appears. So obviously that's not standard issue for a SWAT team. So it's mainly realism, but you know, stuff that people want to play with something that they want to see in the game and use the explanation i've used i don't it's not really official but uh los Buenos police have like a system where you check in your own weapon and register it with the police force so that's that's the explanation for that for me but it's not official it's just how i go around with it but yeah weapon research in general i just you know i, I got vast weapon research knowledge i've handled a bunch of firearms I've got uh friends in the marines that can uh relay information to me firsthand from their experience and you know, I own my own guns, so that's how weapon research goes in that regard. It goes one step further than that as well. Two members that we have in the UK, which is myself and one of the designers, we took a trip up to the Royal Armouries, Leeds, where they have hundreds and thousands of guns. It, it's kind of like the UK's equivalency of like a like a museum, but it's like the secret museum kind of thing. And that was an amazing experience where we just got to ask these experts of firearms basically anything that we needed to know about guns. Play with them is the wrong terminology. We didn't fire anything, but you know, just the action of like loading them and reloading them and there was so much about guns that like I kind of know but it was totally different holding them like I didn't realize how much guns rattled or like how light certain aspects were and how heavy yeah, they absolutely. were and this is definitely something that again I'm not exactly part of the gun development on the team but that was an amazing bit of research that we could bring back and be like oh hey this is something that we never thought about yeah there's a, a YouTube channel Jonathan Ferguson who works at the Royal Armouries he did a, a review of our game and he gave us his expert opinion on some of our weapons he was the guy that was a curator of the museum so yeah we've got like people who know their stuff we are absolutely 100 working with them to make sure that we get it as realistic as we can absolutely and to add on that we actually have a guy from a uh, actual swat team in our development team that you know provides insight on what type of gear and what guns and what type of tactics and uh, everything he's provided so much information to make this almost as close as possible this guy is a valuable asset I mean, he's he's he knocks everything out of the world everything he provides us is insane there's so much information on their equipment equipment, their tactics, their just everything in general. It's just, it's amazing. I don't necessarily believe all of that because they say that they don't want to gamify it when they are actually doing just that. You know, saying one thing, but the action show the other. But listen, I don't really care what they're doing as long as it's a proper spiritual successor to the SWAT series and they make it good. The media can babble all they want about how Ready or Not is the devil or whatnot, because at the end of the day, Ready or Not is just a video game. Fiction that is inspired by reality. People will judge for themselves if the game is good or not and that's how it should be make the product throw it out there and if a lot of people like it they'll put it on a pedestal so much so that the media can't grab it yes this comes from nicholas uh i would love to shed some information on the school level um so yeah this is an excellent platform where we actually get to tell our side of things because you know we've had so much bloody controversy over this suggested school level and it feels so jumped on uh, by the the media like kotaku and various things like that and it feels entirely unjust we're trying to be as tasteful with this kind of stuff and as tactful and and we're not just doing shock value for the sake of shock value. Like, that is so far against of what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, we're trying to tell, I don't want to say realistic stories,
stories because I mean that's kind of the sad aspect of it is that these are realistic stories and we don't want to just like aim a spotlight in a way that makes it look distasteful these are real things that happen and at the end of the day we're a SWAT game and we're talking with people who are dealing with this stuff every single day like we have dedicated SWAT people in the chat that we're talking with and some of the things that you know they report back on are absolutely horrific obviously we can look in any new story and all the all the various shootings it is absolutely horrific and these people who deal with this kind of stuff they are heroes beyond heroes and that's kind of realistically the story that we're trying to tell of just how yeah this stuff is absolutely messed up and we should absolutely be paying attention to it because it's messed up not for any kind of sick you know gamification of it or you know trying to trying to shock people for the sake of shocking it's like no 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 quite absurd that anyone would get that ahead of what we're trying to do absolutely absolutely and you know having a school level is you know yeah it's it's something that we're gonna have to very delicately deal with in a tasteful way and obviously we are going to do our absolute best to to deal with it in a tasteful way but i think it would almost be a disservice if we shied away from it just from a little bit of social pressure was it call of duty that had the airport level yeah yeah my own yeah, yeah. too absolutely obviously when that came out shock and oh everyone was up in arms and various things like that yeah I mean, but it provided a plot, strong point of the game. Absolutely. Like, we are all about that kind of like visceral storytelling. At the end of the day, like, if you're playing our game, and I think Valley is a perfect example of this, where at the end of it, you're like, oh my God, and you have to put the controller down because you felt something. Yeah. That is, that is what we are trying to achieve. Like, we want our players to feel something. And hopefully, like, we can do better as people kind of way. Yeah. And Call of Duty is still doing this to this day. Uh, Martin for 2019 had something similar to uh, a kid being dragged away or something. I can't remember the exact context, but it was in the embassy and it was terrifying. I had to kind of just sit there for a second. I was like, "Is that? Did that really just happen? That's crazy." The house mission with the baby in it—it's just—it's just mind jolting. It's like it's crazy, man. It's like people actually put this stuff in the game to make you feel like, "Wow, this is actually alive. This is a real like this is this is realistic." You'd probably see this stuff happening in real life. It's not yeah, there for, sure. for you know in a negative way. It's there to just show what some of these you know special ops and police have to. Do deal with in this like everyday environment this stuff happens every day for them it's just it's they have to live with it and it's absurd people think we do it just to be edgy or anything like Absolutely. that it's it's, yeah. it's it's ridiculous it's I mean, nothing I, 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 what we're trying to do we're tackling content that is just the realities of it are, are horrific but i think people do shy away from it and too much of the stuff and having a sort of a visceral documented experience that mirrors the reality of it is kind of what this game is about and whenever people want us to shy away from doing this or that it just blows me away because you know you've got it's been the thing in movies for forever you know um <laughs> It, I mean, I mean, I would say one step. It's not. He doesn't glorify it. You know, like no, it, stuff is is visceral and brutal and and real. Just bring something to that experience that's not about being happy that you're seeing it, but it definitely elicits the response of the closest thing you can get to what it'd be like to live it or experience it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And appreciate yeah, like the horror of it, and that you don't have to actually experience those things. <laughs> exactly. And I, and again, I'm so sorry for cutting you off. That's not my intention at all. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. And yeah, it's like, honestly, like for me personally, it's like I find it more offensive that it's like pretending that this stuff doesn't happen, you know, rather than addressing it in a way. Uh, one key distinction that I would like to make, because I did bring it up with the whole Call of Duty airport thing, is like, I do understand the difference there. It's like with that, like the player was the perpetrator, like they were actively doing that kind of stuff. That's not at all what we're intending to do. We're there to resolve the situation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, that that level in general is uh, supposed to portray light on the bad guy in general. So I think that's why it's shown as you being the perpetrator. I don't think at all it was trying to be in a positive way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, Valley again. I keep coming back to that as a really good working example where I've had so many people approach me afterwards who have done a no kill run and they've you know arrested everyone and they've been super you know lawful and dealing with it in a amazing SWAT scenario and then they see the basement. And they're just like, oh my god, this is horrible. I just want to go upstairs and murder them all. And 
obviously I'm not encouraging that by any means but that reaction of like this is so messed up I'm having a reaction to it you want to think the real life SWAT people who are dealing with this kind of stuff they have to deal with that every single day that and somebody you know, has to like, go through those hard drives too think about that yeah you know, to go through all that and look at it and review it it's just it's, just, it's disgusting it's mind-boggling absolutely and you know if, if we can make people better you know playing our humble game ready or not made me want to be a better person because of how messed up humanity is i will absolutely take that as a win for sure Absolutely. I will just say, like, the um, Uvalde footage that was kind of recently released definitely had a big impact on me. Uh, you know, it was really difficult to watch. Yeah, agreed. Just the, you know, seeing him actually, like, walk into the building was, you know. So, yeah, like, again, the school mission isn't, like, being actively worked on. I think it's still kind of in blockout. Yep. Um, but we'll get to it eventually. And, yeah, like, the story is still being kind of figured out for it, uh, how to best handle its presentation and stuff. So. If I'm being honest, I think the whole thing with Modern Warfare was that it really was for shock value. But it also showed that the guy that was in charge of the, you know, massacre of all the civilians is a bad guy. It's blunt force trauma to your face that this guy is not a good guy he's doing bad things and you the player are the one that is going to bring him down but of course you don't bring him down in that game i think you bring him down in the third game if i'm not mistaken but yeah some powerful stuff uh i noticed the lobby has some hidden rooms and offices will you guys be expanding the lobby originally yes that was the plan we were going to expand it to do all kinds of different things but we've changed our vision we've changed what we want to do with the lobby and as we mentioned before we're just going to completely redo it everyone's going to get a brand new lobby with with a ton of storyline, better layout, all these other new fancy features that we're trying to implement as well. The coffee machine staying? <laughs> yes, the coffee machine is still staying. Okay. <laughs> Well, now I feel like I'm doing that HQ video for no freaking reason, but uh, screw it, I'm going to do it anyway. How can we expect the current maps to change, primarily outside entities such as uh, Static SWAT on Brisa Cove? Will they become more expressive, have dialogue with the player, etc.? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I suppose it's just kind of like gets lumped into the overall polish challenge of we finish maps and we move on to other maps, but we never really stop working on anything like I was saying before. So yeah, all of this stuff is just going to get polished and refined and anything that we can do to bring in more life more movement more realism more interaction absolutely yeah we'll just keep going kind of thing honestly i feel like all the maps are definitely missing like static npcs like i feel like there should be a lot more cops around the area especially if it's one where swat are going into it like i feel like there should be a lot more cops around the area and along with that if they see a bad guy they should tell them to get down on the ground and shoot at them if they refuse like if an npc is going to flank me i think they should be smart enough to know not to go outside unless they have a route to escape from Casual Sinner, uh, what kind of accessibility features can we expect for Ron? Such as controller support, aim assist, subtitles, colorblind settings. I believe user's point of The Last of Us 2 is an example of this doing well, uh, doing accessibility correctly. This is absolutely something that we will look into. Keep in mind, everyone, we're still in alpha and we've got a ton of stuff to do. We have already got this on the back of our minds that this is 100% something that we want to implement. We want everyone to enjoy the game however it is that they, you know, whatever support they need to enjoy the game. We will 100% be thinking about ways that we can allow this to happen, 100%. We're still early days, so this stuff will come, but bear with us, everyone. That stuff is a real challenge to implement because it does affect a lot of different things. Like, we're thinking about colorblind settings as a working example. That can quite easily screw with gameplay and it is something that we then need to kind of like implement develop bug fix deal with very specific scenarios that cause problems and so forth and so on the other thing is there's so much about the, the ui that's in flux right now i mean colors and fonts they all could change because we, we are in alpha and I don't really tackle that stuff until we're closer to the end because it needs to be solidified. Otherwise, I'll be constantly going back and have to adjust all of those things in addition to. And when anything can change on a dime right now, it's difficult. As like controller support, I don't like to make a single UI that will just you know handle controllers in PC. I'm going to design for PC first and then I'll design for controllers because I'm just not a fan of, of the games that you could tell they made one UI to fit both and they have to lead toward controllers. So you end up with those really big, chunky UIs. They look like they're made to be used on a TV 15 feet away but they're all things that are definitely planned accessibility is, is key but they've just got to come a little bit later so what they're talking about here is pretty standard stuff that almost every game has unless you're battlefield 2042 obviously void is going to implement all this stuff but i imagine it's not going to take priority until far later on they're just working on stuff that really needs to be finalized and polished like the ai and stuff like that 
from Casual Center again. Is there any progress on the ability to customize AI teammates visually? I mean, yeah, it's not intentionally left out as far as any game design order that I've seen. It's just, I mean, as people can see, it, it's still using the older UI because it's on a different system than the loadout itself. So that's one of the big things that's coming up is integrating it better in with the whole loadout system and then being able to have that be part of what's saved with loadout presets. I am a big fan of customization when it comes to these types of games. I would like to have balaclavas, sunglasses, you name it. Just gimme, gimme. Let me have the option to roll up my sleeves or pull them down. Hell, I'll take short shorts with sandals. I've got one for myself here uh, from, <laughs> I can't pronounce the other thing again, sorry. Uh, did you guys ever experience some copyright issues regarding some of the maps, especially since Hotel was based on the Millennium Baltimore, uh, Baltimore Hotel? Yes. So this is something that with uh, Nightclub we struggled with. I will hold my hands. I was a bit stupid. This was pure ignorance. It wasn't intentional or anything like that. Basically, the, the long and short of it was, and, and again, I'm, I'm kind of clarifying this because Kotaku took the wrong stance on this as well. Yeah, we, we had the nightclub called Prism. It was way, way too close to an already existing nightclub franchise called Prism, but spelt different, different logos. I thought that would be fine. Clearly wasn't fine. And I can kind of see that now in hindsight. That was a little bit stupid. And yeah, you know, we were super quick to react to that as well. Like, we obviously do not want to cause any friction with anyone, copyright or non. Like, it's not our intention to... To, like you know upset anyone so no like straight away we were on that we changed it all and you know it was resolved within kind of 24 hours kind of thing i hardly even noticed it was gone like it was fixed in a matter of seconds almost yeah for sure and again it wasn't it wasn't like we were trying to be cheeky or anything like that. it was honestly just a little bit stupid i was like oh well it's it's technically different enough but i can definitely see why that would have been a problem you know I don't think we were necessarily stupid. I just, just think it was unaware. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm trying to remember what that Kotaku article actually said. They said that it was, like, pulled off of Steam because of the school shooting level or something along those lines. I just remember them writing an article and not, like, confirming their sources at all. Even in the article itself, it said, while not confirmed, we think, and it's like, wait a minute, you can't just... How are you gonna write an article and then not confirm your goddamn sources? And I'm just like, man, this is like the fucking pinnacle right here. The reason why people hate media is you don't confirm your freaking sources. You just say whatever you want to get clicks. But yeah, this developer kind of confirms what we already speculated on the channel because it was similar to a already big Prism nightclub that's pretty big in the UK, I believe. And that's why they took it down. So they just kind of confirmed it. But yeah. Will suspects be able to use hostages slash civilians as shields? That's an interesting one. I'd love to see that. That comes from Raptor Joe. I think that's planned for the future like how they would uh grab a civilian and then hold them at gunpoint and yeah. sort of use them as a shield yeah i think that's definitely planned that would definitely be a pretty cool feature another game that has this already is probably zero hour but it's not as intuitive as it probably would be in ready or not would definitely like to see what it would look like in this game one from smashing control rebinding at the moment is not great we will be able to set up key combinations in the future such as using control or alt to allow us to use single key for multiple actions. I actually am big on key bindings. I'm left-handed. I use arrow keys, so uh, key bindings is a massive deal to me. So that's something I'm always aware of and always trying to improve. Something about Tarkov that really is intuitive is the, uh, the key bindings, man. You can pretty much bind those keys to do whatever you want in that game, and that's something I'd like to see in this game too, because uh, being left-handed and using arrow keys, it's really cool to be able to bind your key to literally anything, any combination, and it works. Yeah, that's definitely something that I like to do too. I also like to provide the ability to have actions that aren't necessarily bound, but um, bind them separately rather than have toggle options. So these so games will have like a hold croucher or toggle croucher separate option but i'd like to rather have you know it be separate binds if you wanted them to be so you can have a bind for croucher a bind for toggle crouch to use interchangeably it's things like that just haven't gotten to that part to kind of do things in sections so it out to priority then we're going to do planning but uh it's always every time i open up the settings menu i'm like i want to i gotta address this <laughs> i want to want to take it on you know, it's interesting when it comes to key binding because what I like to do in games is never change the key bindings because I want to see what a game is like with their key bindings. I don't like to change it unless it's like really, really bad. Like I think there was one game where I was complaining about this specific key bind, but I didn't want to change it because, you know, I wanted to learn because I don't like to change games key binds because I want to see what the game is like because it gives me like a different feeling every game that I play, different play style, you know. Neovox, sorry if I said that wrong again. 
Uh, how does Void Interactive organize? Do you use something like Trello? That's a really good question. I like talking about sort of like the production of games. You know, I, I know a lot of people who play the game are not just gamers. Like, you know, people are in the industry or wanting to get into the industry or even making their own games themselves. So I always like to talk a little bit about this kind of stuff. Yeah, we use Trello. We don't use it exclusively, but for instance, I use Trello when I'm communicating with the outsource teams because I, th I find it like a really useful way of, you know, having like an in-progress tab and, you know, what's finished and, you know, we can just like throw pictures in and have like a checklist. Super easy, super flexible. So I use that for the outsource guys. Primarily speaking, we just do everything on Discord. Yeah. It's, it's as far as like game production goes, we don't use anything like Jira or anything like that, which is obviously one of the big staples of game development or Shotgun or anything like that. Because we are such a small team, if anything goes wrong, we usually know about it. It's not like it's getting lost within, you know, hundreds of people and we're getting held up for production or, you know, the game's not so expansive that, you know, there's a million billion different bugs. Yeah, things do go wrong, of course. We're usually just like, hey, Mark, there's a hole in the level. Go and fix the hole in the level. So I go and fix the hole in the level. Yeah. Um, it's like, yeah, so it's, it's like super streamlined. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not how games are meant to be made. This is a very, very well-oiled cog like machine that we have right now. We've used different things. Another one that we use is Notion. We use that a lot for like the story-based stuff. So that's kind of like a repository of kind of like any information that we need on the game. These are the feedback of the level. This is like the main story of the level. These are like things that we want to introduce into the level. And it's more like a board for discussion points. Yeah, yeah so like my time being planning. here, we've gone through a couple, you know, work boards, and usually it just ends up falling back on Discord because it's just easier. And making use of Discord's thread system they just added not too long ago is something we uh, utilize as well. Sometimes these boards and these uh, workflow websites can get a little confusing. You know, I find myself not liking them as much as when I can just go in Discord and see my work assigned right there. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Notions, yeah. Notions is good for like uh, issue squashing, so you like list of issues or or something along those lines. But overall, it's just. Sort of planned planning stuff very basic outlines we also use what is it um workflowy just quickly brainstorm and lay out some things but it's just sort of a combination of all those things held together through the discord chat and we'll just kind of link to something really quick if we would need a little bit more documentation or collaboration on it. it's always interesting to see developers how they actually organize the way that they you know do their whole work schedule and stuff and from everything that i've seen in gaming like it's always different maybe these developers have one way of doing it or maybe other developers have a different way of doing it it's always interesting to me to see how you know things go on behind the scenes it makes me wonder if one day i'll make a game or something like that but we'll see i see a lot of questions regarding ai like i'd just like to touch on for the swat and the suspects and stuff um swat we're looking into definitely we're looking to improve them for next update so we're trying to get them to be a bit more autonomous so you don't have to like micromanage every single thing they do so they'll sort of do some things on their own clearing evidence and stuff for you you know they won't enter rooms backwards anymore hopefully uh you know, just looking to refine them a bit more. Same for suspects and civilians. Civilians right now, they just kind of stand in one place and uh, freak out. <laughs> and so we kind of want them to have a bit more character and, you know, interact with the world a bit more, sort of like how Mr. 3D was saying. And yeah, suspects, again, they're going to have some, a lot more animation work done, new actions like, you know, taking hostages and that type of thing. So yeah, just all around the board, there will be improvements for SWAT suspects and civilians everything yeah yeah awesome yeah definitely the dumbest ai is probably still the swat team because more often than not they die than actually freaking getting the job done so that's great that they're looking into that but it would also be cool to see the suspect ai and civilian ai do more stuff so that's pretty cool so that's pretty much it for this video it took way longer to edit this thing down than i initially thought i am probably not going to do this again for a while so i hope you enjoyed it i hope this video gets a decent amount of views because this took me about six days to do and i am really tired i'm probably gonna go take a nap so uh yeah thank you all for watching back it up and do all that stuff that youtube requires you to do and uh yeah thank you for coming out to watch and catch you in the next one Bye bye